Hello and welcome to another Generation Behind Hi-Fi video. Earlier this year, I started a new project called Franken Clips with the primary goal of seeing if it is possible to upgrade a budget subwoofer to the point that it can compete with much more expensive subwoofers in an SPL drag during the intro scene from the movie Doom. I know a lot of people have been excited to see the SPL results from my Franken Clips subwoofer, but as you know, I had a heck of a time with finding an amplifier for this subwoofer. Now that I have an amplifier, it's time to see what Frankenclips can do. If you have seen my previous episodes from my upgrade video series on Frankenclips, then you already know it hasn't been an easy journey. But if you haven't, let me fill you in real quick. This project all started when I did a look inside video on my Klipsch R10SW and noticed that the original driver was pretty wimpy, so I decided to replace it with something better. So I hopped on eBay and started looking at used subwoofer drivers. That's when I noticed that a lot of these nice drivers were all from Martin Logan subwoofers that had bad amplifiers in them. My understanding is the amplifiers in the Dynamo subwoofers are pretty weak and fail prematurely, so owners are electing to part these subwoofers out instead of getting them fixed. Because of this, I was able to secure a really sweet deal on a nice driver that came from a Martin Logan Dynamo 700W subwoofer. This new driver only set me back a little over $40, and that includes shipping. I was hoping the driver would be a drop-in fit, but like most things in life, it wasn't. So my first obstacle was trying to get the new driver to fit into the cabinet of my Klipsch subwoofer. After about 30 minutes with the Dremel tool, I was finally able to get the new driver to fit. But unfortunately, my problems didn't end there. Then came the problems with the cabinet, port tuning, and amplifier. The original Klipsch cabinet had a brace in the center of the cabinet that was blocking the airflow from the vented pole piece of my new driver. The Dremel tool came to the rescue again and I was able to trim the center brace so it wouldn't interfere with the speaker. The next problem I had was with port chuffing and the tuning frequency of the port. I knew in order to resolve these problems, I would need to purchase a tool that would allow me to model this subwoofer's performance on the computer. So I purchased a Dayton Audio DATS V3. This tool allows me to read the TS parameters of the driver so I can find the optimal enclosure size, port diameter, and tuning frequency of this driver. This was probably the hardest step to find solutions for, but it really paid off. And lastly, the amplifier. After getting all of the other issues resolved, I had a heck of a time finding a reliable amplifier for my subwoofer. The original Klipsch amplifier would go into protect mode with my new Martin Logan driver whenever a bass intensive scene would come on. So I purchased an open box 500 watt plate amplifier from Parts Express. But that amplifier arrived DOA. Naturally, Parts Express refunded my money right away, but that still left me needing an amplifier. After a few months went by, I started the amplifier search again and came across a 400 watt rack mount amplifier from Monoprice for a price that seemed well, too good to be true. In all honesty, my expectations were really low on this amplifier, but to my surprise, this very inexpensive subwoofer amplifier went well above and beyond my expectations. This amplifier from Monoprice is rated for 400 watts of RMS power at 4 ohms, and even has an onboard DSP that is completely customizable. And the best part? You can get this amplifier for less than $200. Now that I have an amplifier for Frankenclips that doesn't go into protect mode, it's time to see if this budget subwoofer can hang with the big boys. Before I start this SPL drag, let me go over the testing parameters. The goal of this test is to determine which subwoofer can play the intro scene for my Doom DVD the loudest without distorting. The only speaker that will be playing during this test will be the subwoofer. All of the subwoofers will be measured in decibels using an SPL app on my phone. Whichever subwoofer plays the intro scene the loudest is the winner. So without further ado, let's get ready to rumble! First up is the RHEL HT1205. This subwoofer had an original MSRP of $799. The specs include a sealed cabinet design, a 12 inch driver, and a class D amplifier that is rated for 500 watts.
Not bad, the REL HT1205 was able to achieve 101 decibels on this test. Now let's see what the SVS SP3000 can do. The SVS SP3000 has an MSRP that starts at $1100 for the Black Ash version, and the Gloss Black version is an extra $100 more. This subwoofer features a sealed cabinet design that houses a 13 inch driver, and is powered by a Class D amplifier that is rated for 800 watts of RMS power. Wow, that was intense. I forgot how powerful my SP3000 is. I would say 103 decibels during this test is very respectable. Did you guys notice the picture missing? The picture almost fell down during the tuning sessions with my SP3000 and Frankenklipsch subwoofer. Yikes. I'm getting ready to run Frankenklipsch and I just want to let you guys know that I don't think this amplifier is powerful enough to bring this subwoofer to, to distortion. I cannot hear any distortion at all playing the Doom intro scene with everything maxed out. So I've got my processor maxed. I've got the gain on the amplifier volume maxed to plus nine, that's as loud as it can go. So even with everything maxed out and not being able to bring this subwoofer to distortion, I think you, the viewers, will still be impressed with the output numbers. I know I am. Even if I were to purchase a bigger amplifier, I think the output results would only change by a dB or two. I think Frankenclips is very close to its max output, judging by the excursion coming from the driver. But unfortunately, we won't find out with this amplifier. Holy cow, 105 dB? That's impressive. I know there will be some people in the comments that will probably criticize these results, which is fine. But like I said originally, the only thing I cared about in this test is finding out which subwoofer can produce the highest decibel number without distorting during the intro scene from the movie Doom. So with that being said, please understand that these results don't take into account other factors to measure a subwoofer by. While my Frankenclips subwoofer made a dramatic increase in performance with my modifications, there is still one major issue I still need to work out, and that's port chuffing. I'll talk more about this later. It's hard to believe that earlier this year, this was a simple Klipsch R10SW subwoofer that could only achieve 90 dB of output on the intro scene from the movie Doom. Now this same subwoofer is hitting 105 dB during that same scene and the bass and sound quality has dramatically improved. So was all the work, money, and energy that I put into this subwoofer worth it? Yes and no, and here's why. If you're the type of person that likes to tinker and learn about speaker design like I do, then yes, this project is absolutely worth it. Improving your skill set in speaker design can only be accomplished with hands-on experience like this. This Frankenclips project was an exercise in controlling costs, enclosure design, port tuning, and problem solving. I learned a lot from performing this build, 
but is it actually feasible to do it? Probably not. I spent an additional $336 on Frankenclipsch to get it to this point, and that doesn't include the original $185 purchase price for the subwoofer. But I look at this project differently than most people would. I look at what I spent on Frankenclipsch and think of it as an investment in knowledge because I learned so much from this project, and it was also fun and entertaining to do it. I get it, this type of work isn't for everyone, but I think most people who love speakers will enjoy a project like this. If you're the type of person who would much rather write a check than trying to improve an old budget design, then a project like this probably isn't for you. You're much better off selling your old subwoofer and using that money towards a new one from a reputable manufacturer. In total, I spent $336 on upgrades to get my Frankenclips subwoofer to this level of performance. The used Martin Logan driver, new port, damping material, and various other materials like glue, binding posts, etc. set me back $141. The new Monoprice 400 watt amplifier set me back another $195. If I had to compare Frankenclips to something that you could buy in the store, then I would probably have to spend at least $500 to get similar performance. So how does my Frankenclips subwoofer sound? When listening to the subwoofer at normal to a little bit above normal listening volumes, then I think this subwoofer sounds phenomenal considering what I have into it. This subwoofer behaves a lot like my old SVS PB2000 that I used to own, just without the huge footprint. During movies, the bass output is strong, authoritative, and deep. The new Martin Logan driver is much more dynamic and natural sounding over the original driver, which further enhances the realism and makes the listening experience that much better. I really enjoyed my time most with this subwoofer during my movie watching sessions but it has also surprised me during my music listening sessions too. I'll admit, I'm not a fan of ported subwoofers for listening to music with. To me, ported subwoofers can be a bit overbearing and hard to blend with my main speakers, but having an amplifier with an onboard DSP has allowed me to tune this subwoofer to the point that I kinda like its tonality for music too. While my Frankenclips subwoofer did beat my much more expensive SB3000 in output during this test, there is still no comparison between these two subwoofers, and rightly so. The SB3000 has a far superior driver and amplifier combo than my Frankenclips subwoofer. No doubt Frankenclips benefited tremendously from the upgrades that I performed, but it still can't compare to the SB3000 in sound quality, transient response, and dynamic range. Plus, ported subwoofer designs will always be louder than sealed subwoofer designs when all other variables are equal. Engineers know they can get a few more dB of output from a cheap driver by utilizing a ported enclosure. That's why so many budget subwoofers are typically ported designs. I just didn't want to mislead anyone into thinking that if they can invest $350 into their old Klipsch subwoofer, that somehow, magically, they have an SB3000 killer. That would be totally ridiculous, and that's not what I'm saying here at all. Most of my excitement surrounding Frankenclips is when I think about the other subwoofers that I have owned in that $800 and under price range and think, holy cow, I think my design can actually hang with those. Absolutely. Remember when I said I really liked listening to Frankenclips at normal to a little bit above normal listening volumes? The reason for that is if you crank up the subwoofer too much, then you get really bad port chuffing. So the one thing I really regret is the port design that I went with. Here are the port velocity numbers for Frankenclips in meters per second. You can clearly see that the port velocity peaks around 22.5 meters per second. When I was designing the port, I relied heavily on the information that I had read in the forms. A lot of what I had read said to keep the port velocity below 25 meters a second, which is what I did, but I still get horrific port chuffing when I have things cranked up. You can even hear the port chuffing quite audibly during the SPL test that I did in this very video at the 8 minute and 3 second mark. Here's a quick recap of the port chuffing. See what I mean? If I had a second chance to redesign the port, then I would definitely shoot for a port velocity number that is well under 20 meters a second. I haven't decided yet, but I might do a Frankenclips version 2 video series where I redesigned the port to eliminate the chuffing noises. If I can resolve those chuffing noises, then I think my Frankenclips subwoofer could easily give my old PB2000 a run for its money. 
The tonality and performance I got from my old PB2000 reminds me a lot of my Franken-Klipsch subwoofer. Overall, I'm very happy with the performance from Franken-Klipsch. If I listen to the subwoofer at a reasonable volume, then the port shuffling is inaudible, but it still bugs me. I had a lot of fun doing this project, and also learned a lot too. Hopefully you can learn from my mistakes in this video. If you'd like me to do a Franken-Klipsch version 2 project, then make sure to hit that like button. Let me know what you think of Franken-Klipsch by leaving a comment down below. So long, and happy listening.